Good afternoon, everyone. So IFAS is still away, doing some uh, in very important research in East Canada. So you are stuck with me for a while. Um, thank you, everyone, to join us today. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Jacqueline Hughes, who recently defended her thesis here at the University of Calgary. And we'll have her convocation tomorrow. So please go and support her tomorrow. So some background of uh, Dr. Hughes. She received her bachelor's degree in physiotherapy in 2009 at Santa Catarina State University, Brazil. After this, she went on to do a master's degree in the same institutions and receive a master's degree in human movement science for her thesis titled The Strategies of Postural Adjustment in Subjects with Functional Ankle Instability. In 2014, Jacqueline decided to move to Calgary and started her doctoral degree with Dr. Walter Herzog here at the University of Calgary. In general, she's interested in understanding the metabolic disease and aging related to osteoarthritis. Specifically for her PhD work, she looked into the effects of exercise and uh, diet on metabolic osteoarthritis using a RAT model. Now, at this early stage of her career, she has already received some high profile accolades. Last year, she won the prestigious David Winter Doctoral Young Investigator Award in the meeting of uh, Canadian Society for Biomechanics. And this year, she received the J.B. Hind Research Innovation Award from the University of Calgary. I'm sure more awards will follow as she moves into her new positions as a postdoc at the start of next year at the University of Medical Center Utrecht in the Netherlands. In her PhD work, Jacqueline had been working hard to make the rats exercise trend new. But as she pointed out to me, or to Ifas, despite her best efforts, it seems like she exercised her rats more often than she exercised herself. However, she compensates that by supplementing her diet with prebiotics. Now, this means one of the two things. Either her work shows a promising effect of the prebiotics, or the, you know, she has a whole bunch of supplements that she has to get rid of. Now, we'll figure it out in her work, um, in her talk right now, and I'll pass this on to Dr. Jacqueline Hughes on exercise and dietary interventions in a red model of metabolic knee osteoarthritis, please. Thank you, Enkwa. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be back in Calgary to present and talk a little bit about the work that I did during my PhD. Um, with Dr. Herzog, and I will start talking a little bit about the rationality of my PhD work, so I'll talk a little bit about metabolic osteoarthritis, I'll talk a little bit about exercise and prebiotic fiber and why I think we can use them uh, to prevent metabolic osteoarthritis. Then I will uh, talk a little bit about the three main studies that I did during my PhD, and I called them the exercise study, the prevention study, and the rescue study, and you are going to understand that as I go uh, with my talk. So, uh, metabolic syndrome, it's a complex disease, uh, and it's defined as a pathological condition characterized by visceral obesity, uh, insulin resistance, high blood pressure, and dyslipidemia that would be high triglycerides and low HDL cholesterol. And uh, metabolic syndrome actually it's associated with a series of diseases, and recently it has also been associated with osteoarthritis. And when we have any of these marks of metabolic syndrome associated with osteoarthritis, we actually call this uh, metabolic osteoarthritis or metabolic OA phenotype. But how uh, does metabolic syndrome cause osteoarthritis? So in summary, what we can say is that when we are talking about dyslipidemia, 
we are talking about ectopic lipid deposition in the chondrocyte that might lead to osteoarthritis. And when we are talking specifically about visceral obesity, uh, we are talking about the fat tissue that we have associated with that, that might release adipokines. And adipokines, with adipokines, we are gonna have the expression of pro-inflammatory marks that may inhibit the cartilage matrix syntax and also might suppress bone formation. And all of that might lead to osteoarthritis. Now regarding uh, high blood sugar, we know that high blood sugar is associated with the accumulation of glucose, and that might lead to chronic low grades of systemic and local inflammation, uh, and also it's associated with an increase in oxidative stress that also might lead to matrix stiffness, subchondral bone destruction, and chondrocyte dysfunction, and all of that might lead to osteoarthritis. And last but not least, high blood pressure that is associated with the narrowing of the blood vessels, and that might compromise the nutrient exchange in the subchondral bone. And if we don't have a healthy subchondral bone, the cartilage on the top of that will not be healthy as well, and that, that might lead to osteoarthritis. So uh, metabolic syndrome, it's usually associated with the consumption of diets rich in fat and sugar. So actually about the cookies, it's good that we don't have cookies today, so we're not gonna have sugar and fat. <laughs> During my presentation, no one is gonna feel bad that they are having cookies when I speak. So a diet rich in fat and sugar, it's also associated with what we call uh, dysbiosis. And what is that? Actually, that is the imbalance between the good and the bad bacteria in your gut. And when we have this dysbiosis, usually we have a phenomenon that it's called the leak gut. So I will try to explain quickly what it's the uh, leak gut syndrome. So here we have a healthy intestinal mucosal cells. And when we have this imbalance between the good and the bad bacteria, uh, we end up having a spacing between those cells, what allows the leak of um, what the leak of the toxins that we have in our gut to the bloodstream. And this toxin we usually call them the endotoxin. And when we have that, we usually have this, uh, some systemic chronic inflammation going on. And that has been associated with the development also of osteoarthritis. So as many of you know, there is no cure or disease modifying treatment for osteoarthritis. However, it is thought that uh, metabolic disturbers can be modifiable if we change the diet, for example. So we, what we can do here, we can use exercise or prebiotic fiber to try to modulate the body fat and increase metabolic health. And that has been shown in previous study. And it's also thought that exercise and prebiotic fiber might reduce marks of inflammation and pain and improve functional ability of the knee when we are talking about OA. Uh, with that said, in our lab, using a Sprague Dolly rat model, it has been shown if we fed rats for 12 weeks a high fat, high sucrose diet, these animals will develop osteoarthritis. For example, here in your left, you can see an animal that was fed a standard shawl lean diet. And this is how the knee joint for these animals look like. So here in the top, we have the femur, in the bottom, the tibia. These triangles over here are the menisci. This bluish area here, and here it's the subchondral bone. And this pinkish layer here, and here it's the cartilage. So overall, this would be how a health knee joint looks like. Now, when we feed these animals with a high fat, high sucrose diet, this is how these animals look like. And this is how the knee joint looks like. You can see that we have something going on in the cartilage, it's not health anymore, and we have some degradation of the subchondral bone adjacent to that area. So now that we have this model, the natural questions that I had was, can we use exercise or the prebiotic fiber supplementation 
to prevent or delay the rate of progression of osteoarthritis in this model. So uh, the main goal of my thesis was to determine the effect of prebiotic fiber supplementation and treadmill exercise on the onset and the rate of progression of knee osteoarthritis in a diet-induced model of metabolic disturbance. So the, the thing that I asked myself, is this prebiotic fiber safe to use in the Sprague Dolly Brat? That is the model that we would be using. And the answer is yes, there are uh, several papers published about that and this fiber seems to be safe for these animals. However, regarding the treadmill exercise, that was what I was planning on using in this model, we were not that sure because there were a few papers uh, that were saying the exercise was not good for the joint of these animals and a few papers saying that was beneficial. So uh, we decided actually to test first before we start doing the experiments. This is why I have three studies. First, I have the exercise study to be sure that I can use exercise or not. Uh, in this animal model, and then the prevention, the rescue study. I will start talking about the exercise first. So the main goal of the exercise study was to determine the effect of a stepwise increase in speed and duration of treadmill training on knee joint integrity and to identify the potential uh, treadmill training threshold for the development of joint damage in this model. And our hypothesis was that excessive chronic treadmill training actually would lead to development of osteoarthritis-like chains in the cartilage of the animals, while moderate exercise would be beneficial for the cartilage of these animals. So in order to test our hypothesis, we worked with 10 to 12 weeks old Sprague Dolly rats, and we randomized these animals in four groups. So the first group, we had sedentary animals where the animals were restricted to cage activities. The second group was the moderate duration training where the animals exercised uh, up to half hour a day, five days per week. The high duration where the animals exercise one hour a day, five days a week. And the extra high duration where from week one to week nine, the animals exercise one hour a day, seven days a week. And from week 10 to week 12, we had a progressive increase where the animals end up doing four hours per day, seven days per week. And the duration of the whole protocol was 12 weeks. So, oops, for those of you that are not familiar, this was working before, like here, uh, with Animal study, this is how it looks like when we have a rat running a treadmill. Um, usually they do. If they are not in pain, they, they seem to do pretty well and they don't mind that much. And the key outcomes of this study for sure is the knee joint integrity. And to assess that, we actually did the histology. So we harvest the knee joints at the end of this experiment protocol. Uh, we process the joints and then we end up with an image like this, for example, and we use the modified monkey score to score those joints. And for the secondary outcomes, we had the body mass and the body composition. We also have marks for inflammation. As well, uh, we look for systemic inflammation and we also look for specific marks for the joint tissue itself. Today, I'll only be talking about the knee joint integrity. So the result for the knee joint integrity, here we have the total monkey score. And in the y-axis, we have uh, the modified monkey score. So greater the score, worse the outcome for the knee joint of these animals. And here in the x-axis, we have the groups. So the sedentary animals, the control group on average, they had a healthy joint and I score around 21. The moderate duration group had a similar score. So as we hypothesized, was not detrimental to the knee joint of these animals when the animals did the moderate duration training. Now let's look at the high duration. It seems pretty similar, right? And the same thing for the extra high duration. So at first when I was analyzing these results and I looked at the data, I was like, 
well, it was not what I was expecting. I was a little bit upset, actually, to be honest. And then I started thinking about it, and actually, I was quite pleased in the end, because that means if you are in a health situation, in your knee joint, if you progressively increase the amount of exercise that you are doing, you are not going to damage your knee joint. So actually, that was quite interesting in the end. So the conclusion for the first study would be that treadmill exercise at any test duration uh, was a safe intervention for this model and could be used for the next studies that we were designing. So the goal of the prevention study was to determine the effect of prebiotic fiber supplementation and this treadmill exercise that we just talked about on the onset and the rate of progression of knee osteoarthritis uh, in a diet induced model of metabolic disturbance. So, oh, sorry, that was the general goal for the thesis. The goal here was to determine the effect of prebiotic fiber and aerobic exercise and the combination of them uh, on the onset of metabolic NEOA in these animals. So our hypothesis here would be that the prebiotic fiber and the exercise and the combination of them would prevent osteoarthritis-like change in this model. So what we did here, uh, we randomized our spread dolly rats in five groups. So in the first group, the animals were fed the same standard shell diet that I talked about before. And just to give you a little bit more details now, uh, this diet is composed of 5% of fat and only 4% of the carbohydrate of this diet is composed from sucrose that it's highlighted here in red. And these animals, they were restricted to cage activity only. The second group of animals, the animals were fed a high fat, high sucrose diet and 20% of the content of this diet comes from fat and all the carbohydrate content, so 50% of this diet comes from sucrose. And these animals were also restricted to cage activity only. The third group, the same high fat, high sucrose diet, but the animals received a prebiotic fiber supplementation. Fourth group, same diet, but the animals undertook exercise intervention. And in the last group, same diet, and we used the combination of the prebiotic fiber and the exercise. So the prebiotic fiber that we used in this study was 10% of oligofructose supplementation. And in the nature, we find this uh, fiber in garlic, onion, Jerusalem artichoke, banana, and chicory root. And in our study, it was an extract from chicory roots. For the exercise, we used the moderate duration from the previous study that I showed you. And why we choose the moderate duration? It's because <laughs> that is the minimum amount of exercise that we should be doing per week. So the key outcomes of this study were the knee joint integrity, and we processed the joints in the similar way and used the modified monkey scoring system to get the numbers for these joints. And the secondary outcomes were body mass and body composition, and we used the DEX scanner at the end point to evaluate the amount of fat and the lean mass that these animals had. Uh, we also measured the insulin sensitivity, and we did that by gavaging the animals with glucose. Then we follow up over two hours measure, to measure glucose and insulin in these animals, and then we were able to calculate the composite insulin sensitivity index. Also was done in the endpoint. Uh, we also collect the blood, so we fast the animals for 16 hours and we are able to measure the lipid profile for these animals and also inflammation. We also looked at endotoxin that I talked during uh, the background. So to do that, we also collect the blood from the animals and I use the colorimetric uh, endotoxin assay to measure the amount of endotoxin systemically in these animals. I will mainly be talking about the results for the knee joint integrity, body composition, and insulin sensitivity for this study. 
So let's start with the results for the knee joint integrity. So this is how uh, knee joint for chow fed animal looked like in this study. So this arrow actually it's point out uh, the bone marrow in the subchondral bone and it looks quite healthy in this animal as expected. Now this is how a knee joint for an animal that was fed, fed high fat, high sucrose looked like in my study. So here you can see that the bone marrow was replaced for some sort of fibrotic tissue. And since we don't, we are missing tissue here, the cartilage seems not to have the support that it needs to stay where it should be. So we see this collapse of the cartilage adjacent to this area. And now when we look to the animals that start the high fat, high sucrose diet and the prebiotic fiber supplementation at the same day, the knee joint looks like this. And when we exercise the animals, they look like this. And when we combine fiber and exercise, they look like this. So what do you think? They look pretty similar to the shell fed animals, right? So when we quantify those images, we end up with this graph. So here we have again the modified monkey score and the groups. And as expected, we have a high score for the animals fed a high fat, high sucrose diet. But if we have fiber supplementation, exercise, or the combination of fiber and exercise, we are able to keep similar numbers as the animals fed a shell standard diet. So as Anquan was saying during my presentation, when I start uh, dissecting the tissue from these animals or seeing how healthy the animals that were eating the fiber were, so I decide, okay, so maybe it's the time since I'm not exercising that much, we start eating the fiber, adding, adding the fiber in my diet, and this is when I did it. So talking about the metabolic profile for these animals, just to summarize, Overall, what we saw is that the prebiotic fiber and the exercise, they prevent changes in the metabolic profile of these animals that were fed a high fat, high sucrose diet. And I will present the data from insulin sensitivity uh, to show you a little bit of that. So for the composite insulin sensitivity <coughs> index here in the uh, Y axis, actually as greater, it's better for the animal. It's better if you have a higher insulin sensitivity. So as expected, the animals that were fed a high fat, high sucrose diet had a worse profile for the insulin sensitivity. However, with the interventions, we were able to prevent that. Something that was quite interesting is when we look at the body fat, the percent body fat in these animals. As expected, the animals that were fed a high fat, high sucrose diet had a higher percent body fat. But against our initial hypothesis, the fiber doesn't seem to do much, neither the exercise, but the combination brought it back to similar val values than the animals fed a chow diet. What that tells us, it's like what we are seeing these animals, it's not only related with the amount of fat that they have in their body, but it might seem related to actually to the metabolic syndrome, the metabolic disturbance that these animals have. Because with the intervention, we were able to prevent metabolic disturbance, but we are not able to prevent increases in body fat. So we should keep in mind that sometimes the person can have a lot of body fat, but that, that doesn't mean that the person is not healthy. And we should keep that in mind. So uh, based on some of the results of my thesis and some of the literature findings, I would summarize that a high fat, high sucrose diet leads to leptin resistance, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, leak gut, and that with that we have uh, decreased bone formation, increased bone resorption that all led to osteonecrosis like chains in the subchondral bone as I have showed you in one of my slides. 
also led to ectopic lipid deposition in chondrocytes <coughs> and synovitis. And when we have that, we end up with the collapse of the cartilage or with the degeneration of the cartilage itself that will lead to metabolic knee osteoarthritis. However, if we combine aerobic exercise and prebiotic fiber, we are able to prevent metabolic syndrome. And in this way, we are able to keep uh, the knee healthy. So the main conclusion for this, the second study was that prebiotic fiber, aerobic exercise, and the combination of the two interventions, they prevent the knee joint damage that is usually observed in this model. And this prevention was mostly associated with the normalization of insulin uh, resistance, leptin levels, dyslipidemia, and enotoxemia in the high fat, high sucrose fat rats. So now that we know we can prevent, we need to know if we could treat or stop the progression of the disease once we have the damage in the knee joint. So we designed what we call the rescue study. So the goal here was to determine the effect of prebiotic fiber supplementation, aerobic exercise, and the combination on the progression of metabolic knee osteoarthritis in, a, in rats fed a high fat, high sucrose diet. And the hypothesis was that uh, fiber supplementation and exercise in the combination when introduced 12 weeks after the onset of a high fat, high sucrose diet exposure would reduce the progression of OA like damage in this model. So the design is pretty similar than the the previous study. What changed here is that we first randomized the animals in two groups, the standard child diet and the high fat, high sucrose diet. Then after 12 weeks in their respective diets, we um, randomized the animals in the high fat, high sucrose diet in four subgroups. So we would have a sedentary group, a high fat, high sucrose group combined with fiber, another high fat, high sucrose diet combined with exercise, and then the high fat, high sucrose diet combined with fiber and exercise. So the duration of this study was uh, 24 weeks uh, that each animal is spending in this protocol. The main outcome is still the same, the knee joint integrity, and the secondary outcomes are pretty similar. So we had body composition, what was quite nice in this study, we were able to measure at the midpoint. So after these animals were exposed to the diet, we were able to scan these animals. So we have a midpoint measurement and an endpoint measurement. And we also have insulin sensitivity and the lipid profile for these animals. And for uh, these outcomes, we are able actually to collect a baseline value, a midpoint value and an endpoint value. So we could follow up and see what was happening with these animals throughout the study. And I will be mainly talking about these two outcomes, the knee joint and the lipid profile. So for the knee joint, what we have, uh, this is how the knee joint for the animals fed a high fat, high sucrose diet looked like. So we can see that a piece of the cartilage is actually gone here. We have the replacement of the subchondral bone, uh, sorry, the bone marrow in the subchondral bone by fibrotic tissue. The meniscus is destroyed. So this looks like a pretty bad joint as expected. Now, what about the fiber? And the exercise and the combination? Doesn't seem they did much to the joint of these animals once they start after we already have the initial damage. However, what was most surprising to me, it's this. This is how the knee joint of a child health standard fed animal looks like. So we were expecting a nice clean joint. And unfortunately, it's not what we see. So if we convert this, images in numbers, this is what we see. We don't see change between groups. 
groups. And actually our control group has really bad joints as well. So regarding the metabolic profile, what happened? So overall, what we notice is that aerobic exercise in the combination of the fiber and the aerobic exercise, they improved some marks of metabolic disturbance uh, in these animals, but they didn't bring that uh, numbers back to the baseline values. So I'm gonna show you uh, the LDL cholesterol as an example. So here is the data that we have at the end of the experiment protocol. As we expect, the animals that were fed a high fat, high sucrose diet had a higher profile for the LDL cholesterol. We still see a really high profile for the animals that were fed the fiber, but somehow we see better numbers for the animals that undertook the exercise or the fiber combined with the exercise. However, what was quite interesting as well is that when we look at the shell fed animals that it's here in white what we see that is an increase in the week 24 when we compare with the baseline and that is significantly different uh, and we see that for other marks for metabolic syndrome as well so it seems like these shell fed healthy animals are not that healthy anymore so in summary for the last study, it seems like that moderate exercise and the combination of prebiotic fiber supplementation and moderate exercise, they improve some marks of metabolic disturbance. However, these interventions did not seem to slow down or to accelerate the progression of the knee damage. So if I'm going to have overall conclusion of the work that I just presented, what I would tell you is that prebiotic fiber and moderate exercise, they prevent knee like damage in this model. They prevent metabolic disturbance. They do not stop the progression of existing knee osteoarthritis, but they also don't seem to increase the progression of this existing knee osteoarthritis. Um, and it seems like they are both safe strategies for populations with metabolic knee osteoarthritis who may need or want to exercise um, or supplement their diets with prebiotics to alleviate other health related problems such as diabetes and cardiovascular problems. And I really wish I could change my take home message from my first HPL seminar five years ago, I guess. Uh, that was Oops, sorry. That was prevention is still the best medicine. It seems like we still cannot do much regarding treatment. We have to prevent the disease. So let's eat well and exercise. And I would like to acknowledge uh, my supervisor and the whole Herzog group, Dr. Hart group, Raylene Heimer group, and the Lazark staff. And thank you. So what do you, I mean, what do you think could be, if they are mm -hmm. more, or if they're trending more, do you think that there is something about the exercise that's beneficial from a biomechanical or a biochemical that the chow, for example, who are not exercised, mm -hmm. are getting? We just, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. We can go into different ways uh, to answer that. We can think about the mechanical, the, that we don't have as many load as we should have in the joint, and we know the joint needs some load, the cartilage needs load uh, to be able to survive. So if we unload the cartilage, we are gonna have lots of deleterious effects. 
but there are also another thing with the exercise you are making the environment the, the body itself healthier so metabolic speaking you are healthier and that might be beneficial to the new joint because you don't have as many bad end products in the body that might lead to chronic systemic inflammation that also might be associated with some sort of degradation on the joints uh, but to be honest with you sometimes it's a little bit tricky when we make these scores in the these slides in the numbers but visually i would tell you that they are pretty similar and i would not go that far to tell you that there is something really going on that the score didn't pick for example i, I don't think so at this point i don't think so so building on that mm -hmm. what kind of measurements uh score go into the uh, Mankin score? What okay. kind of things? So we are using the modified Mankin score. Yeah. And for this specific study, we are talking about the combination of the modified Mankin score and also uh, part of the subscore for Bonn from Orsi that was also modified. So there are things that you're looking at in the histology that are sort of bone centric and not exactly. just cartilage -centric. Exactly, and most of the chains they came from the bone score and not from the cartilage score. So why don't you think that the exercise would, because if you did see beneficial changes, I would expect it to be in the subchondral bone mm -hmm. and probably nowhere else. Um, but you're saying that you don't think that the exercise had sort of a, a positive effect if I have said that, I'm sorry, I mean in this model, these animals, they had the high fat, high sucrose diet combined with the exercise. If you might only exercise, we didn't see um, in the first study, but we used a reduced modified, if I can call like that, monkey score. We only had a small component for bone in that score, but although what we have in the score itself would not have picked anything that I could tell you that actually the exercise was better because we didn't see a big damage in the bone of the control animal. So the score that we used at that time would not be sensitive enough to tell me, oh, this is really being positive and bringing anabolic things to the bone itself. Uh, at this point, I would not be able to answer that with the evaluation that was done. So, uh, just between this study and your lab, your, your rescue study, mm -hmm. did you take a look at the Mankin scores for the high fat animals at 12 weeks versus that endpoint? Because I would assume that all your high fat animals for that 12 weeks of initial dietary intervention would have had knees that would have been like <coughs> these high fat animals. So are they worse? So let me see if I understood your question. You're asking if I had compared from the second study at 12 weeks, the high fat, high sucrose animals at 12 weeks with the 24 weeks in the last study. What I can tell you, if we get the worst animal at the 24 weeks would be worse than what we see at week 12. But we had a few animals that didn't have that bad joints so it brought the score down so when you look at the average it seems similar but in the end it's not so i'd expect all your high fat animals to, at, well when you started your mm -hmm. intervention to all have bad joints yeah. so i wouldn't expect to see yeah. any, any scores lower yeah. than this high fat animal at 12 weeks but unfortunately that was not the case First of all, I would like to make a compliment. Beautiful study, very well presented. Thank, Thank you. you. Can you go to the, you know, the beginning you made a pre-study where you analyzed whether the animals should be exercised and how much. Mm -hmm. Can you go to the slide? This one? one? No, after that. The result of it. Oh, for the, okay. Uh, for the graph itself, right? This one. Yeah. 
So it is in interesting that the red has the highest standard deviation and the green was the second highest. So that means you have some animals that didn't like the treatment anyway. Um, that was, I understand. So here we would have a bigger variation and here, but that was not like that much difference, I would say. But yes, uh, overall for all groups, we have better or worse joints. And I think that it's probably something that is from the animals itself, because let's say if- If you look at the different animals, you know the ones that will be below the average, the ones that will be above, did they react differently? I want to say, there yeah. Are 12 in a group, if you say four, mm -hmm. four. I wouldn't say, I don't remember, exactly because this was the first one but I, I don't recall that was a big difference from let's say the one or two animals that we would have higher here would not be that much but that one I have to be honest with you this one is a long time ago I don't remember the individual animals for that one but I don't think was that big of a difference that would that we would be able to split in two different groups and say these animals have really good joints and these animals have really bad joints. We, we didn't have that for this specific study. Um, second question I have. Mm -hmm. If I go in a store mm -hmm. and want to buy prebiotic fiber, mm -hmm. what do I buy? Uh, before I would say you can buy, go at Safeway and buy at Safeway. Now that I got back in Calgary, I didn't find at Safeway anymore. <laughs> so I have to change my answer. But you can find in any other drugstore that I'm aware, at least I found it, and you would find as the name of inulin. It's because inulin, inulin and olig fructose, they, they are quite similar. The only thing that changes is the amount of carbon that you have um, in the molecule, but the so effects are the same. Mm -hmm. you buy mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't want to say what it is, <laughs> but would Why? be Benefiber. Yeah. Do <laughs> 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 so I cannot go and say I want to have bananas and, and onions? It's not enough the amount that we would need to find in the banana and in the onions. You would have to have a lot of bananas and onions per day. And with that, you would have a lot of other carbohydrates that you don't want to have in your diet. So our diet, it's kind of poor in this sort of fiber, unfortunately. So it is much more than you find in your normal? You, we, yeah that we would have in the normal diet. Usually we would not just supplement it. Uh, so continuing on from this, mm -hmm. if you continue to study for the full 24 weeks mm -hmm. that you did the last study, would you expect to see significant differences here? The short answer is I don't know. But <laughs> I can speculate on that. So what I can tell you in the last week, when this group was doing four hours per day, uh, the animals were not liking it anymore. Let's summarize in that way. So I would say maybe we could be overtraining these animals if we keep four hours per day for a few more weeks, or maybe not. Maybe they would adapt and we would haven't any damage in the cartilage itself. So at this point, I can see we having an adaptation and still not having the bad effects. But I also can see the other side as an overtraining or something like that. And at that point, it might start to be detrimental to the knee joints. And as well, we allowed was not four hours in a row. It was like one hour early in the morning, one hour a little bit before lunch, one hour a little bit after lunch and one hour in the end of the afternoon. So the animals had a break, so they might have had the time to recover 
from that. Maybe if we do four hours in a row, that will not be good for the joints. We don't know that. So I'm also referencing in terms of how sedentary behavior affects. So mm -hmm. you didn't see a sedentary oh, behavior effect yeah. at 12 weeks mm -hmm. in your last study, but you did see a sedentary behavior effect at 24 weeks. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm inquiring yeah. to see if, if you would continue on this study, what you would think would happen. Based in, in the case. last study, I would say yes, we would see but I really don't know. But based on the data, my answer would be yes. So, Jeffrey, I'm sure you've been asked this, but from your prevention study, mm -hmm. translating this from rat to human, what dose is required at both to be effective in people? We don't know. So, if I'm not wrong, Raf is here. No, he's not here. Rafael Fortuna, he is doing now, but he's doing, I would say, the last study. It's when the subjects already have osteoarthritis and he introduces prebiotic fiber to see if he can stop the progression of the disease. Uh, think in a preventive way, we don't have data for that because, and I don't think we will have any time somewhere at any time because we cannot ask someone to have a bad diet and introduce at the same time fiber and exercise but what i would well i just need to dose dependent you know, if you calculate so many milligrams oh. of fiber mm -hmm. for a rat and then mm -hmm. oh, move I that see. to a 80 kilograms mm -hmm. what can, can, can move the moderate exercise to a, from a rat mm -hmm. to keep your little legs mm -hmm. just speculate so first of all, the amount of fiber that we would consume would be uh, not be 10% of our diet as we did with the animals because that would be too much for us. We would have a teaspoon per day and that would be enough to supplement the diet. Otherwise, we would have bad intestinal effects with the prebiotic fiber. And by bad, I mean not that it would be unhealthy, but it would be uncomfortable effects. Uh, for the exercise, it's hard to say. You have uh, 180 kilometers or something like that. For the rats? Yeah. Yes, let me go back to that slide. That was at the end of the study, was not at the beginning. 180 kilometers? Yeah, uh, over 12 weeks. This is what that's the rats did. That's huge. Yeah, because they are small animals, right? For them, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but that was over 12 weeks. To bamf and back. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that is a lot of exercise. So what I did for the prevention study was this one. So it was the 41 kilometers over 12 weeks. And this is the minimum amount of exercise to say to keep someone metabolically healthy. So I would say if we can be metabolic healthy, your joints will be healthy. So I would say I would translate in a similar manner, but it's pretty hard to say for sure. But that would be what I would say. Um, I'm still am interested in how we, you go from, you know, the rats to the, to the human and and back to this, this question. So is 30 minutes of exercise five days a week for a rat? For sure the distance mm -hmm. traveled is gonna be different. Yeah. But like, is 30 minutes a day, five times a week, the same like training load as it would be for me to run 30 minutes a day, five days a week? I want to say it would probably be similar because of the speed that you would be doing it, but I don't know the answer for sure. I never calculate. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get VO2 for these animals to see the energy consumption. So if I, if I had done that, I could answer a little bit more precise, but I don't have that. But uh, I would speculate would be similar. 
but I don't know for sure, to be honest with you. How fast was the treadmill? Uh, 25 meters per minute. And uh, something that was, I didn't talk much, this was a gradual increase. So actually in the first four weeks, uh, we start the speed and the duration was shorter. So we don't start at the first day, uh, half hour per day, 25 meters per minute. It was a progressive increase. And we think this is quite important because most of the studies where they show that exercise is detrimental to the knee joint of rats, they don't have this progressive increase. They just start and they do it. So we think that you need to start slowly and progress towards. I think that is quite important to point out. Has anybody been able to see progressive joint damage in a healthy animal model as a function of exercise, like long duration exercise? Yes, but was not progressive, the exercise, they started. Yeah, I, I guess I meant damage yeah. over time. Yeah. So what do you have to do to do that? They used another rat they worked with, Wister. Uh, actually, that is going to be quite interesting because one of the groups that have shown these results is the group where I'm going to be doing my postdoc right now. Uh, and this is something we want to explore more because we think there are some difference in the strain of these animals that might even be affected with the diet and the exercise itself. So hopefully this is something I can explore when I'm over there. Or if it's really the exercise because it was not a progressive increase and this is why the animals develop away, we really don't know at this point. And is, is the EHD the same model that Kevin tried to use to overtrain These rats? These are the same never, animals, yes. And he said that they never were overtrained. Exactly. So what should I, how should I think about that EHD? Should I think about that as like Extra high a duration. lot of exercise or is it more like? I would say a lot of exercise, but it was not detrimental to the health of the animals because we have marks, anabolic and catabolic systemic marks, and we don't see an imbalance between groups. <coughs> They're still healthy. Why do you explain that? Or how do you explain that, that all the runners and they turn 60 stop running? I don't know why they stop running. Usually it's it, a cartilage problem. But it usually is associated with a lesion that they had. So if you have a lesion in the knee joint, if you have an ACL transaction or if your menis meniscus is damaged, you and if you keep doing exercise, it has been shown in animal models at least that you develop osteoarthritis. So I think if you have a disease beforehand, a problem beforehand in the knee, and if you exercise, that might be detrimental to some extent. But also we have studies with humans, with us, that show if you have osteoarthritis and if you exercise, your quality of life in improves, although you don't see change in the x-ray. So it's like, we really don't know, but usually, yeah, but usually people that stop running or something like that, they had some probably in the knee, an injury beforehand. How translatable do you think your data is to humans? You have mentioned that there might be variation even within different mouse or rat models. Mm -hmm. So then how translatable do you think that this is to humans? Mm -hmm. Based in the literature that we have about prebiotic fiber and exercise for other sort of diseases in humans, um, we see similar effects, for example, for metabolic syndrome and this kind of things. And if we think the problem in the knee joint is associated with metabolic syndrome, I would say that they are quite translatable. So if you can prevent metabolic syndrome, you can prevent knee osteoarthritis that is associated with a bad diet. And that is something I'm glad you asked because I want to make clear. This is for when we are talking about a high fat, high sucrose diet. It's not if you have an ACL transaction, if you have injury. I don't know if with injury this would work.
It might, but we don't know. This is something that people have been discussing a lot is about the phenotypes of the disease. So sometimes it's useful to classify phenotypes because maybe what causes the disease is not the same thing. So the way that you treat the disease will not be the same. Okay. What about when this is all males? Yes. Right? So and in humans, OA is more common in women and it's in men. So, mm -hmm. so speculate about what's driving this. Is it metabolic syndrome or is it something in your hormones or or what? And if you were to repeat this study in female rats, what would you expect? If I would repeat the study, I actually would go in another direction. I would actually follow up first these male animals longer to see what's happening in the knee joint because uh, when we, we kept them till 36 weeks old, we saw that the joints are not that healthy anymore. But if I would do with females, I would expect speculating, I really don't know, but I would expect probably similar results, but we might would have to wait a little bit longer because it seems like the males develop a little bit quicker than the females, but I'm not quite sure why in the, this animal model. Uh, the disease itself, like I would say, even to get obesity, they would take a little bit longer than the males. So it would be the opposite than what we see in men and women for the male and female is dolly rat, sort of. So maybe we would have to wait a little bit longer to see, but I would speculate the results would be pretty similar, a little bit more messed up because of the hormonal variation in these animals. So probably would not be as clear picture and we would need a few more animals per group to be able to visualize that, but I would still speculate to be similar. The study that I'm aware uh, was actually an epidemiological study and what they noticed is that people that had had more fiber in the diet but they don't specify if it's prebiotics or which sort, specifically if it's oligofructose or what kind of fiber, we don't know that from that study. What they say uh, is that people feel I, it's not pain but the quality of life is better for the people that had the fiber. And I don't recall now, if I'm not wrong, I think the damage when you look at the x-ray would be the same for the population that had the fiber and the population that didn't have the fiber, but they didn't feel as much pain and they were more active than the population that didn't have fiber. But it's a <coughs> prospective study, so it's hard to say. Uh, so this is somehow what uh, Rafael Fortuna is doing right now. and. Uh, less Orsi or two horses ago. I think Dr. Dave Felson told me he would be doing the same study because he's the one that published this paper, this prospective study, and he told me he would start a big clinical trial to see the effects of prebiotic fiber in this population. I guess I'm more interested in the, like, a preclinical model mm -hmm. where you can assess things like neuropathic pain mm -hmm. and to see if giving them fiber I don't know, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Do you look at how much a rat grimaces when you... <laughs> we actually could runs. use pressure tests. We have sensors that you can press and see how long and how much pressure the animal will tolerate in the joint before it removes it. And also heat tests in the paw to see when they withdraw the paw. Yeah, uh, we haven't done that, So, but that is a possibility. And uh, that is something would be nice to incorporate in the next studies because this is what we need in real life. People don't want to have pain, they want to reduce the pain. So I think that needs to be incorporated in these preclinic models in the future. 
Actually, when I talk about metabolic syndrome, I don't talk only about inflammation. The chronic systemic inflammation is something that usually it's associated with, with it, but we don't know exactly how that is related to osteoarthritis itself. So I actually avoid you saying that it's the inflammation that it's associated. In my opinion, the only thing we can say right now, it's associated with the marks of metabolic syndrome, but I'm not really sure if it's associated with the inflammation or not. But we also measured uh, at local inflammation in the synovial fluid for these animals. Uh, unfortunately, we only can have data for the end point when we sacrifice <coughs> the animals that we can collect the fluid because it's so tiny we cannot get fluid uh, over time from these animals. And when we only have the endpoint data, at least um, we are using the Luminex technology and it's, uh, it's so variable the data that if we don't have like a baseline measurement to compare with, sometimes it's a little bit hard to infer something. And once we run the assay, if something goes, goes wrong for one of the markers, we cannot run again. So when we did for my animals, we lost a, a lot of important markers as IL interleukin-6, that usually it's the one that it's increased, but was above the curve, the threshold curve. So we didn't get any measurements for that. So we tried to measure the data that we had available. We didn't find difference between the groups, but the most important proteins we were not able to evaluate because they were above or below the threshold for this study. I don't really understand between above or below the threshold. So the setting of the measurement is not uh, set correctly or? It's because what you do, you get your sample yeah. and uh, all your sample goes in one trial and you have um, based on previous data that were analyzed, you have, uh, I forgot, Tim, help me, the curve, the it's standard it's curve. It's okay. It's no, no, above. it's above or below the standard curve. Yeah. So if you don't add that values, you cannot build up and extrapolate the numbers. But I would say it would be an error of the measurement, yes. And we don't have for really important markers. All right, any question from the audience? If not, let's thank Dr. Hughes again. <laughs> So next week, next week we have uh, Colin Frominger, and he's gonna tell us about tendon mechanics. And please come back. <laughs>